Greetings everyone and welcome back to the John Audio Tech Show. Time to move ahead with the discrete audio amplifier build project. In the last video I talked about pretty much on paper about the biasing circuit, thermal stability, and mainly concerned with this circuit right here, bias servo, VBE multiplier, whatever you want to call it. Now I want to actually set up a circuit and run some tests. But before we get started here on the messy workbench, we have a kitty cat who has planted its butt on this computer here. Underneath is a computer, laptop. But we have the Snickers here and I want to wish him a happy birthday. Snickers is now 13 years old. Well, I don't know his exact birth date, but when I got him in the summer of 2006, by his age I can tell he was born in either January or maybe February. So he's got to be 13 years old now. And so glad to have him here with me. Right, Snickers? There we go. Say hi to the fans, Snickers. <laughs> Say hi to the fans. So if you haven't seen the last video where I talked about you know, some of the theory of operation of the circuit, you might want to check that out because you know, I'm not going to explain everything again because I want to move ahead and you know, set this up on a breadboard and actually run some tests. And that's exactly what I've done here. I've replicated this circuit on a breadboard and I put some components in to start out with. Yeah, just to see if it's going to be in the ballpark. Now it's very important to understand that this circuit is not going to handle any signal. It's not going to handle uh, heavy currents, driving a speaker or anything like that. It is just for testing bias and thermal stability. So I'm not using current sources in this circuit. I'm just using resistors to set the current which would be used in the voltage amplification stage which would be this part of the circuit right here right before the drivers and the output. Now in a earlier video I discussed about the current I was going to use in the voltage amplification stage. I was kind of thinking it would be around 10 milliamps but you know after doing some calculations I figured that is a little excessive. You know, it's going to cause excessive dissipation. Well maybe not excessive but kind of high dissipation in the uh, voltage amplification stage components and I wanted to avoid that yet make sure I still have ample current to drive the output stage to its full capability. So after some test I determined that around six or six and a half milliamps was plenty of current to use. It would reduce the dissipation of the components in the VAS stage and uh, still allow more than enough current to drive the output stage to its full capability. So uh, that's how I determined the value of these resistors here. In actual use, the amplifier will have a dual plus and minus 35 volt supply. However, my power supply on the bench here only goes up to 32 volts. However, we'll, we'll lose, uh, we'll just say a couple volts due to these junctions here base emitter junctions. So I will just say we'll have a 31 volt supply. In other words, across this thing will be 62 volts. So with 62 volts across this, 6.5 milliamps in the voltage amplification stage. And we'll see, we'll take 62 divided by 0 0.0065 amps, which is 6.5 milliamps. That gives us 9.538 ohms. There's going to be two resistors divided by two. So it comes around 4.7K. So that's how I chose those resistors. I could have just said 31 volts divided by 6.5 milliamps and got that directly instead of dividing by two. Six of one, half a dozen of the other to get that calculation. Okay, so I got the circuit set up here. We'll take a look at it, get a clearer focus. 
this is the upper driver and output transistor lower driver output transistor 0.22 ohm emitter resistor this is the VBE multiplier transistor this is the 1k trimmer and this resistor here 2.2k is that little one under there I did add a capacitor for supply bypass I don't expect this current would oscillate since it's just conducting small idle currents but uh, it's good practice to go ahead and bypass the supply anyway just in case so another thing I had to do is grab this aluminum bar stock and drill some holes and tap them and I'll apply the thermal compound and mount it up to the transistors here now it doesn't have to be the full size heat sink that's used in the final amplifier one reason is it would take forever to get this thing up to temperature and test it so I want to use a small thermal load by using this much smaller heat sink that way I can test this circuit I can heat this up with an external source if I wanted to and you know get this thing hot to see how the bias current fluctuates with temperature make sure it's not gonna go outside the range I selected for the bias make sure it doesn't thermally run away and all that good stuff so go ahead and get these mounted and proceed on with the video I will say a couple things here on this breadboard I have to make sure that the resistances of these connections with these output transistors is not going to add enough resistance here to throw off my measurements so I did measure that and we're not getting significant differences I measured at the emitters of these output transistors I was getting the same value so we're not getting a lot of connection loss here on this board which is good I need to monitor the current in the output stage what I could do is break this circuit at some point and measure it however that's not a very good idea because we're dealing with very low resistances and the leads of the meter would add to that and it could throw off the characteristics of this output stage so instead I'm just going to measure the voltage drop across one of these resistors and in doing that I can use Ohm's law to calculate the current passing through the resistor and that would allow me to pretty accurately uh, monitor the current okay so now I have the transistors mounted up to the heat sink I use these little rubber type pads I guess they're made out of some sort of silicon and the nylon washer here that isolates the screw from touching the tabs because the transistor tabs are the collectors and the collectors you can see here are tied to each supply rail so they must be isolated from the heat sink this transistor doesn't have a metal tab on the back so we can just bolt it up directly so we got that taken care of I should mention if you actually build the amplifier you want to use those mica type insulators because they have much better thermal conductivity now as I said this circuits only handling small biasing currents you know there's not going to be a lot of thermal conduction we don't in other words I don't need the heavy thermal conduction that I would if this was for example dissipating a lot of power but you know we'll still get enough through to heat this up significantly for the test okay so I have the supply connected have leads connected across the resistor here which I'll monitor the voltage with this meter we have the cat supervising what's going on here and the supply is hooked up and ready to go so I have it set for serial mode set for its full 32 volts output or 64 volts total there is no ground in the circuit this circuit doesn't have any ground reference so it's just the total 
across the rail voltages here, 64 volts. And of course, I have the current limit set to 100 milliamps because I don't want to blow anything up if something's connected wrong, which I often do. So I turn it on and it's already current limiting. I probably just need to twiddle this dial and drop the bias current. But let me sort this thing out here before I move ahead. So I adjusted the trimmer, which has 25 turns from end to end, and that got it into a usable range. So let's turn the power supply on and see what happens. I should mention that current I measure across the emitter resistor at 50 milliamps with the emitter resistor value being 0.22 would be 11 millivolts and at 35 milliamps it'll be 7.7 .7. and at the minimum 25 it'll be 5.5 .5. so let's turn the supply on and see what this thing does okay started out at 5 point something and it's quickly increasing Well, this is clearly not doing the job. We're already far outside the range. 37, and we only wanted 11 millivolts. Um, I'm going to try changing this resistor value here. I noticed that this only changes near the very end of its range, so it's kind of touchy. So I'm going to see what happens if I change the value of that resistor. Okay, so what I've done is change this little resistor down here, which is this one, to 1K. It was 2.2K before, but now it's 1K. Let me turn the power supply on and see what happens. Okay, we're starting at 2.6. It's just an arbitrary setting. We'll see what happens here with the current. So here's what's happening with this thing. When I first apply power, it shoots up to around 13 point something millivolts, which is over the limit. And then it drops back down. So what what's happening here is Snickers. Oh God, see what you did? You knocked that over. These cats. <laughs> Having cats around. Okay, so where was I before I was so rudely interrupted? So yeah, what's happening here is these pads, they're not very thermally conductive. I, you know, I'm not a big fan of them. So these transistors turn on and they conduct and they warm up right away before the heat can be drawn out of them. So the current shoots up. So once heat gets into the heat sink, it eventually conducts over to this transistor. And when this warms up, it brings the current back down again. So that's very good to see. And with the actual heat sink I would use, it'd have a thicker back plane. I'd use mica washers. And I don't think you would see that sudden rise because the transistors wouldn't get real hot when you first turn it on. So my next test is to heat up this heat sink to mimic the amplifier after it's been driven really hard and got the heat sink hot. I want to see what the bias is. So to do that I just clipped on this MOSFET and I'm driving it with another power supply causing a voltage drop across it with enough current and that generates heat which is dissipated into the heat sink. Interesting thing with these MOSFETs if I touch my finger on the drain to gate It'll charge the gate up, and you notice there's nothing connected to it. And I actually did that yesterday, and it still retains that same charge after I touched it. And it's, you can see the current's up, and the voltage is about 10 volts, and dissipating about 12 watts into the heat sink. Well, that creates a problem. You see what it does to the bias? It, when I heat it up so hot, you know, I can still touch it, but the heat sink is pretty hot right now. 
Well, the bias drops really low. It drops below the lower limit that I wanted. I wanted five and a half milliamps, and it's you know it dropped to under three. So that means the circuit is overcompensating. So I'm going to have to do something about that. So what I want to do is stop here and do another video about correcting this thing. So what I'm going to do is just make this a little less sensitive, make it a little less effective so it doesn't overcompensate when the amplifier is hot. You know, it's just another step in designing this thing. This is one thing that's got to be right. I don't want to release an amplifier that has a problem with, you know, thermal issues. You know, it, obviously it's not going to thermally run away, but it's going to overcompensate if it gets hot, which could lead to um, some higher distortion levels after the amplifier's been run pretty hard. So definitely got to get that corrected. So I'll, I'll make another video on that. I don't want these videos getting too long per session because you know, if you get over 20 minutes, then you don't get as many views and all that good stuff. I don't get as many views as it is, so you know I want to kind of maximize things, keep the videos under 20 minutes where I can. You know, correcting this issue is probably going to be another at least 10, 15 minutes on to this video, and I don't want to get it that long. So we'll wrap it up here and stay tuned. The saga continues. Thanks for watching.